Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, this is an event on sustainable capacity development. Um, it has a particular fo focus for the Sahil region. And one of the things I wanted to talk about is the successes and the challenges that we have in sustainable development um, and capacity building in the Sahil region. And my background is in isotope hydrology. I manage the water resources program at the International Atomic Energy Agency. And what we do is we use isotopes to look at the movement of water through the hydrological system. And we use these techniques to build a picture of the water resources in different areas and to understand how we can use water sustainably, um, particularly as climate change starts to bite and we see movement and changes in the way in which water is distributed. When we use isotope hydrology, one of the things that we want to do is we want to transfer this technology to different countries to allow them to adopt the technology and better manage their water resources. But there are a number of challenges um, in doing this, not just in the Sahil, but in, in all areas around the world. Um, sometimes um, technology uh, serves a good purpose and sometimes it can be difficult to adapt depending on what the circumstances are. Um, what I'm, I, I'm, I'm joined here today by three people um, who also work in capacity development, in sustainable water resource, but in different areas and different aspects. Um, so I have, um, to my um, immediate right, I have um, Stefan uh, Uhlenbrook, who is the Director of Hydrosphere, Water and Cryosphere at the WMO. Next to him, I have Christoph Henrik, who is a project management officer in the technical cooperation department at the International Topic Energy Agency. And next to Christoph is Elizabeth Carradine, who is currently climate advisor to the UN Office of the Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, where she works on peace and security management issues. Where she, but she has previously been in the Sahil region and many of the issues uh, between the Sahil and the Horn of Africa are very, very similar. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to start with Henrik. Um, the reason is that at the International Atomic Energy Agency, whilst we spend a lot of time developing scientific technology and innovations um, to help us manage water resources, we also need to transfer these technologies to member states. And that happens via the technical cooperation department um, at the agency. And they, uh, they work with the department that I'm in, the Department of Nuclear Sciences and Applications, to help bring these skills um, to, uh, to countries that need to adopt them. So I'm going to hand over to Christoph to say a few words about how the technical operation program works um, and how this helps to build um, capacity development. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Uh, very glad to be here. So um, if it comes to capacity development in uh, this area and actually uh, overall when we look at how technical cooperation in the agency works, is I would say that one of the unique um, uh, features of our assistance to member states is that we are really, and that is not only looking into water areas but also in the other areas, that we are really looking into building up the capacity in the country in order for them to sustainably operate these technologies going forward. So what we are usually avoiding to do is to uh, outsource any um, uh, expertise, uh, expert assignments, publishing of reports, but we rather really want to focus on building up this expertise in the country so that optimally the, the country, once it has received the capacity, uh, take, picks up this knowledge and applies it sustainably in its, all, uh, in its own operations. Now, of course, this is uh, a challenging um, work because all of us working in the development sector and uh, uh, looking into um, sustainability issues of uh, development operations know that, um, that, that this work is uh, not easy in order to achieve actual sustainable impact. And for example, 
uh, when we when we want to when we look into isotope biology and uh, want to disseminate this knowledge in uh, into the uh, in uh, into our member states, we first have to actually work on improving the knowledge uh, that these techniques exist. Because even among expertise um, among experts, um, uh, it is not often well known what these technologies and um, um, and technologies can bring to the table in order to actually. Uh, help countries to understand their resources better and once you have this knowledge that you can generate by using these technologies sustainably hopefully in your own operations um, it has to be ensured that um, this information is actually being picked up being picked up by the governments uh, either in shaping their national policies or um, by other development actors that are designing water projects in that area so um, events like this one here can of course help to sort of disseminate this knowledge uh, among the international community but also governments have to increasingly be made aware of um, this, uh, um, this intersectoral and uh, interconnected uh, work which is very challenging uh, to do so. And uh, thirdly, we, we, have to, um, uh, we have to further increase technology exchange and uh, uh, capacity building and utilizing their particularly um, regional uh, regional expertise. So in regions that we work that share similar problems, share similar capacity issues, but also the same development issues or similar development issues, to ensure that these countries start collaborating and actually maybe by the facilitation and support of international organizations, um, but not or bilaterally help each other and increase their capacity. So that uh, once this information uh, that uh, is being produced uh, by these laboratories, uh, for example, that also um, have to be able to ensure that they are actually uh, working sustainable and actually that their work is being meaningful and being picked up so that they are actually being contracted uh, later on. So um, I think one important uh, statistics I wanted to say as well is that we had looked into this isotopology linked to policy making and uh, uh, in, in other regions where, um, where um, for example, a significant uh, low amount, like not even 20% uh, uh, have stated of the counterparts that we have asked, have stated that they are regularly using isotope hydrology for policy making. So there is lots of work to be done, uh, not only on the national but also um, on the regional and international level. And uh, I believe uh, capacity building has to continue and continue and continue. Thank you very much, uh, Christoph. Um, I think some of the points that you make about policy are really important, um, that we can develop a lot of technology, we can emphasize science and its importance, but we need this taken up at policy level, at government level. And perhaps um, then I could hand it over to Elizabeth, because um, Elizabeth, you work with um, policy, management, um, peace and security aspects of water. What would your, be your perspectives on capacity development, how it impacts the adoption of these types of innovative science and, and, and technologies at policy level? Thanks very much uh, for inviting me to this discussion. Um, and as you said, I'm working <laughs> more <laughs> more on the um, political end, but what we find in our work, uh, which is focusing on the horn uh, at these days, but ha it have also applied in the Sahel, is that when we're talking about very um, difficult issues of transboundary, whether that's transboundary between states or between communities um, or other you know, administrative boundaries or customary boundaries with communities, um, or governments, these are very contentious issues usually. Um, these are systems in the Sahel, for example, that are under various kinds of stress, including climate change, but also, you know, rapid social changes, not to mention conflict and insecurity. So what we find very much in our work in the, in the more on the peace negotiation or uh, side is that the technical entry points are the ones that are the most effective. So when we want to to start having difficult conversations, we find the technical counterparts, whether they're in government or communities, who can start to discuss 
what evidence do we have about the resources? Do we know, uh, you know, anything about the extent of either groundwater or surface water resources? Do we know much about the use? The answer is usually no, but you usually do find very good technical people uh, in all these contexts, but with limited technological capacities, like, like you're saying. When we start from that entry point, you can build a lot of um, trust between the various parties at whichever level uh, and start to really move towards the more difficult discussions of how you would allocate resources or manage across borders. Um, it's an approach we use in, uh, I can g give two kinds of examples, one from the Mopti region in Mali uh, bordering Burkina Faso the example as being 29 different territorial entities trying to manage, uh, you know, scarce water, uh, wetland resources. Their idea was to come together and create a, a plan, sustainable development plan over 10 years so that they could have a starting point for investment and negotiation with each other. What was decided quite early on was to also do a process of strategic environmental assessment alongside that to build the baseline, uh, gather all the evidence at a, at a very um, in, uh, UN <laughs> key of protocol standard uh, was very important to them, uh, which at the same time as having that plan adopted by the state level then, uh, they also were able to have the, the SEA and the plan adopted at the same time, which really gave them capacities and governance, uh, strengthened governance to implement uh, and get additional assistance. Other examples that, in less detail, you know, negotiations about transboundary water in the Horn, we really have to start them uh, from a technical standpoint with technical members of those parties, uh, really as a trust building exercise. And we always need more, um, you know, not necessarily human resources, but data, technological resources, techniques um, that, that can help us to try to overcome assumptions, uh, you know, clarify what the evidence is, maybe bust some myths that, that can arise and move us towards progress on the thorny issues. Thanks. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, you, you mentioned there at the end, you mentioned data. And this is something that we also deal with at the, at the International Atomic Energy Agency, the importance of data. And data and information has been highlighted as one of the key accelerators for achieving SDG 6, which is well off target at the moment. And capacity development will feed into trying to improve the achievement of that goal. But Stefan, if we might come to you, the WMO, of course, um, has huge amounts of data. It looks a lot at data and data management. But also the WMO, um, I guess, is one of the, the UN organisations that really deals with transboundary issues because weather is not a national issue. Weather is regional, continental scale. So from WMO's perspective, where do you see capacity development issues um, from, from a weather perspective, a climate perspective, the actions that you can take? Uh, uh, thanks, Jody. Good question. Well, I, I don't think the, the, um, the main challenges are so different from what Christoph already said. You know, there's a huge, tremendous need for more capacity building, very much needs the capacity at the ground in the operational positions to really make a difference. I think that is true for isotopes, it's true for hydrometeorological data and, uh, and you name it, yeah? <laughs> it's, it's probably all the same. Uh, at, at WMO, what, what we are doing, um, I, I would like to report one example, which I, I think you want to have the main focus on the Sahel today. And um, what we do in the Volta Basin, which is a basin, it's a transboundary river basin, which is shared between Ghana as most downstream country, but then Mali, Burkina Faso, a bit of Ivory Coast, Togo, and Benin, uh, a, a little bit. I, um, did I say this year already? But so it's kind of really a transboundary. Sharing of, of, hydro, of, of meteorological data is challenging, but often possible. But sharing of hydrological data is often very challenging in, in many parts of the world. However, as, as you know, the, the UN Secretary General, um, about half a year ago on World Meteorological Day, he said, well, in five years from now, we should have all people around the world uh, covered by an early warning system to national hazards. And, and this is ambition. In five years from now, though, by, by 2027, we, we should all have um, all people of the world all covered. No? 
And then WMO was, was tasked with the, um, or the, the Secretary General of, the, of WMO, of course. And, of course. And um, uh, he has some people helping there. And uh, then he was tasked with, with developing an action plan. How do we, how do we get this? How do we get uh, half of the planet under early warning system? Because what our data shows that only half of the members of WMO have a, a kind of a, an early warning system that is up and running when it comes to floods and droughts and storms, so very water related. For this water basin, one of our projects is, uh, it's, I have to mention the Adaptation Fund, who invests eight million for this project in this region, uh, is to cover uh, this in a flood, integrated flood and drought early warning system. And we do not use isotope data yet, so that's, that's something I, I wanted to mention. But overall, it has been developed as kind of a integrated model where you have static data and, and time series and you kind of combine that with the latest databases so to to issue warnings so, but it's not only the the technological part it's also what do you do with the warning how do you inform local people how do you how do you alert them and and, and kind of uh, provide guidance for for actions on the ground so it's going to be the end-to-end -end system from the observation down to the people who um, then have to act um, while doing this, a lot of data is as, um, kind of integrated, the data that is available. But, but what is not done, to the best of my knowledge, in these type of systems is the use of isotopes data. So I'm, I'm coming to your question. It was a long introduction, sorry for this. but <laughs> That's quite all right. Uh, um, you can bring in isotopes anytime. Yeah, anytime. And particularly, I believe, in the, uh, in the drought assessment, drought forecasting, understanding you know, from which groundwater bodies that the low flows are fed getting understanding through the age of the system of kind of how vulnerable are the system, how, what is memory effect and what is the kind of the, 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 the amount of resources that is still there to make better assessments of future development of their droughts. Uh, isotopes would be there, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, they're not used. So, so even if I, I, I uh, applaud for that, for all the capacity building you're doing, but, but it's still kind of a not, not mainstream, not operational in, in many, many regions of the world, including in the Sahel. So that's a challenge that I'm fully prepared to take on. Uh, we at the, the IAEA are very committed to nuclear sciences, as you know, and I, I just think it's important to highlight how powerful nuclear sciences are in terms of water sustainability. Because nuclear science, is really, we're just talking about sciences that occur at the atomic scale. And in isotope hydrology, what we are doing is that we're saying that instead of just having a water molecule, we have an isotopic water molecule. And you can have different types of water molecules depending on the isotope composition. And we can interrogate the differences in those isotope compositions to understand the history of that water molecule. How old is it? Where has it come from? What was its source region? And I think a lot of the issues that you're talking about in terms of early warning, one of the things or one of the areas that we can contribute with isotope hydrology is understanding where the molecule has come from, how long has it been sitting in the system, and what do we think is going to happen and be the response to these types of, um, to, or to the types of events you're talking about, floods and droughts, what impact do they have on the hydrological cycle. But one of, the, one of the pieces of information that we need for that is monitoring data, right? We need to understand how the system is changing. What are the hydrological alterations? So in, uh, in the work that we do in collaboration with the Technical Cooperation Department, we, um, for example, in this region, we, we run a, a large project called the, the Regional Africa 7021 project. And as part of that project, we are supporting capacity development by investing in students. We are funding MSc students, we are funding PhD students to learn about isotope hydrology techniques, to learn about the science, how it helps with water management. And hopefully those people who have that strong technical background will go on into the policy framework, the government framework, and help to bring the science into the mainstream. But let me just ask you a, a question with a slightly different focus. When we support those students, they need to go out into the field and they need to collect a physical sample. With the WMO, as you're saying, with, with improving meteorological records, 
A lot of the focus of the WMO has been on automation of information. How do you think that intersects with capacity development? Because from our perspective, so for example with isotope hydrology, a lot of it is based on physically doing something with a student, with them collecting a sample, with them learning techniques and then building up this capacity and sending it through the system. But what happens, what are the consequences, for example, of automating these systems so there's no longer a person who physically takes a sample? putting you on but, the spot there. Yeah, yeah, no, no, thank you. Very very good question. I, I'm sure it depends on what type of isotopes are we talking about. If it's a stable isotopes of, of the water molecule, that, that's easy. It's like that it, taking a sample is relatively easy. You need to protect the sample from evaporation, as you very well know, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not so difficult. Huh? If we talk about um, gases, um, that, that's much more complicated. If we talk about tritium, it's also at least you need more volume and you need very advanced techniques to actually analyze it. I, to the best of my knowledge, only IAEA and a few a couple of other laboratories actually can, can do the analysis. So, um, so it, it depends on the isotopes. Um, so I, the, I have the feeling it's so rare, the data. Um, so the automation of the, taking the sample is not, is not, the, is not the obstacle. I think it's the knowledge, it's the, less, the, the lack of investment into these uh, data sets anyhow. If, if we get people interested in the data, if we see, if, if, we, if they understand the usability of it, if they understand how much it can help them to, to actually predict, you know, so much water is still somewhere in the catchment because we have um, water of, of, I don't know, pre-season or, or, or kind of paleo groundwater, whatever. So, so really get, getting a better understanding of the physical system and, and appreciating that. Then, then we also find somebody to take the sample, I believe. So I, I, I don't think that the optimization of sampling is, I would think is not the biggest uh, obstacle, but it's more kind of mainstreaming that into our activity. So it's kind of, maybe you have a good ally now at the IAEA, somebody who has some isotope ideology background, but also working at, at WMO. Um, maybe together we, we can make a difference and, and kind of get isotope data collection more into the, uh, into the operational uh, monitoring systems. Yeah, that's certainly one of our goals. Um, with, um, it's interesting that the, the different perspectives that we have on what are important, what is doable, what is not doable. Um, and this, I, I think, um, comes into the issues of, of capacity development, what we can and we can't do. And it's interesting to hear the different types of perspectives. Um, if I come back to Elizabeth now, though, um, I know you have some background in water quality, and this is this is a little bit um, uh, uh, different to what we we've done previously. We have increasingly um, a strong focus on water quality because this is a, a, an issue that we see that has a very strong transboundary focus in it because there are a lot of um, different um, industries that are impacting on water quality as they come through. How, how is that tape being taken up um, at government level? Because I, I think that water quality is increasingly becoming a very core issue uh, for many governments worldwide. And the, the impact that deteriorating water quality has on the amount of water that is available to do specific types of tasks, for example, drinking water, water for agriculture, for growing crops, for running industry. What is there a perspective that you have on that? Yeah, I think uh, there's increasing focus on that at, at the same time as you start to see in some of the countries of both the regions I've been discussing, um, more emphasis on environmental justice and climate justice and attention on you know environmental conditions. Um, and it, where I have worked on it a bit more intensely is actually in the Horn, in the Rift Valley Lakes, uh, around the development of agriculture and particularly flower farms um, was my perspective working with the Dutch government uh, around the lakes of Ethiopia and, and Kenya and to some extent Uganda and I mean that's been a long term problem but we start to see a lot more um, in interest of those three governments to address the problem uh, and at the same time of the businesses involved uh, whether you know private sector so to, to join up on the planning around uh, you know the use of the water, but also addressing quality issues, invasive species issues. There's a whole 
whole range uh, and voluntarily adopting some standards, um, you know, as an industry uh, to, to try to invest, uh, private investment into addressing the problem of water quality, knowing that the, the business uh, horizon is limited if, if that's not addressed. And I think the, the pressure, I mean, you see new regulations and laws coming in around the, the climate policies that these countries are adopting. Kenya and Uganda, for example, have climate bills now where communities can you know, hold their governments accountable um, for issues that are affecting them related to climate change and sometimes environmental factors. And you see those courses, uh, court cases being, being, uh, you know, brought forward, and those are usually around forests or around water, uh, and you know the the whole sustainability issue. Often, young people very passionate about this too. So governments are responding uh, to the change in emphasis. Thank you for that. So, let's just come back to young people, Christoph. Um, the agency has um, a number of programs, actions to support young people. Do you want to maybe elaborate on those? I mean, I know that I could as well, but I think from uh, that's one of the focuses of the technical cooperation is bringing that capacity, and particularly on young people, bringing them into the sciences. How do can you uh, maybe get, provide some statements about how that works from technical cooperation's perspective? So, um, as you have been uh, already sort of pointing out before, uh, a lot of our capacity building uh, activities and trainings that we offer are really hands-on. So, we try to enable uh, young scientists, researchers to go into the field, to go to a hosting organization and to actually stay with them for uh, a couple of months even, to really uptake uh, 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 and intensify the knowledge that can be trans uh, transferred to them. This is sort of uh, what we call a fellowship and uh, is our longest term individual training. And we, we also do, of course, national uh, uh, shorter term training courses where we provide the expertise from outside. We do a lot of regional exchanges, regional training courses that are maybe not as long, but often also hands on and uh, which enable uh, the already uh, mentioned by myself um, um, uh, regional cooperation that is uh, very, very important as well. Um, for example, in uh, the COVID pandemic, we were, as I guess all uh, development organizations that are doing capacity building, um, uh, had uh, a number of issues to actually implement our program um, that as we were used to. So back in those days, we, we, we transferred a lot to uh, virtual trainings. And uh, in, in, my, in my projects, actually, we did a number of virtual training courses on isotopatology, in this case for the Europe and Central Asia region, which haven't been existing before. Uh, and because of that external factor, COVID, uh, we are continuing to do these courses as an introductory course uh, to uh, basically uh, introduce the topic to some researchers. It's not meant to be um, um, ex replacing the actual hands-on, it's not even, uh, it's not meant to and it's not uh, possible to replace the hands-on long-term uh, in-person training. But it can be a nice complementary feature uh, um, if you, um, uh, to the existing capacity building suite or tools that we may have. So, as I'm listening to what we're talking about, and I think it's just really coming out with what you're talking about now with the virtual training, um, one of the, the, the points of this particular session was to talk about capacity development in the Sahil and the particular challenges that it faces. And we've talked about actually a, a wide range of issues, um, had a bit of one of those circular types of conversations that move from one topic to another. But which of these issues are particular to the Sahil? I mean, what is it? Uh, every, every region has that particular, that specific um, issue, those, um, those problems that are inherent to, to that region. What is it about the Sahil, do you think, that is particularly challenging? I mean, 
based on what you've just said now, one of the things is obviously the ability to, de to deliver virtual training courses because there's, a, there's obviously that connectivity issue. But what are the other issues that are perhaps particular to the Sahil that collectively, I mean, we have the IAEA, we have the WMO, we have UNEP represented here. Where are the areas that we maybe need to focus? I don't know, Stefan, whether you maybe want to, to comment on that. With particular focus on isotope hydrology, you mean, or, or I think maybe capacity talks, in general? Yeah, I think capacity in general. Yeah, I, I have to admit that I'm not the expert for that region, but but I believe it's it's a combination of um, uh, you know really least developed countries like uh, Mali and Niger and, and some others, and, and others are m maybe a bit further on the development scale, but also still lower middle income. <coughs> So I know what comes with it that in general there there's always a, a huge lack of capacity building, but also they um, even in my home country you know you have a lack of capacity when it comes to understanding the importance of isotope hydrology. So if if even some basic parameters for for closing a water balance are not already collected, no, then then more advanced nuclear techniques are of course not the highest priority in many countries because people also underestimate and don't, don't even know what you can learn with, with taking regular samples, you know. You, to some extent, you, big word now, cover up for, for the lack of monitoring for the last decades, you know, because you, you get a, a, some insights about the past. You, you're not redeveloping time series, but, but you at least you get an understanding of systems behavior, about interacting of, of uh, for instance, different depths or shallow versus deeper groundwater systems, etc., which is already very insightful for water management. So, so the, the development scale is one of the things, Then is of course a, a, a language issue, but, but that can be overcome, I, I, I believe, with, with the trainers that you can engage. And, and, and some, some parts of this are held, there's also just very serious security issues, which um, draw the attention to other things than, than studying isotope hydrology, because just, you know, human security is is already compromised in, in, in many parts, as we, as we know. So that, that does make um, effects of capacity building efforts even more, more difficult. I, I, I mean, I, I think I completely agree with that. And, and water is um, a main factor, an important factor in regional security. And this is what you really focus on, right, Elizabeth? Um, do you, if we can maybe pass the microphone back to Elizabeth. I, I, how, how can we better leverage technical developments, technical capacity to help mitigate these types of issues? Well, I mean, I, I was giving some examples at the beginning about how technical engagement and assistance can start a conversation towards something more tricky, but. I think in addition, I really agree with, with what Stefan's saying about the context of the Sahel is a low development base. Like, it's important to remember, I work in the Horn now, they're very much miles apart, you know, in terms of the, the baseline uh, of development. Having said that, and the insecurity and the political instability that comes with that, which we see in the region, is challenging because then your ability for technical expertise to to be you know incorporated into policy or for that policy to be implemented is quite limited under these transitional you know unstable situations we see in the Sahel however I mean what's particular to the Sahel you are asking is my experience is that there are excellent technical institutions and universities in Burkina Faso in Mali in Senegal and you know depending how you in Niger that are ready to, you know, absorb such uh, training uh, and, you know, capacity development that you're talking about. And I think there's, there's many reasons in my work on peace and security where we look to the Sahel because regional approaches are very, they're very conducive for regional approaches to problems, uh, which, which other regions are not. Uh, the the context for cooperation, uh, it, you know, is quite historical. It's, it's all countries want to work together as a regional block for the reasons we've just mentioned that, that they're, you know, fighting for resources and attention a lot of the time. Very good at integrating across different sectors. So, you know, water, whether it's water management, but also 
the question you were asking about how that intersects with industry and agriculture, very, uh, you know, there are mechanisms for doing that uh, in that region. And we look to it really it's for arranging the governance around those things. We look to that region from the horn uh, to, to see how we can model those kinds of um, governance or institutional solutions. But, you know, uh, there is a challenge I know from some of my former colleagues in the universities to now advance uh, scientifically with the instability and, and insecurity that's really, I mean, you can't underestimate in the, the five Sahel countries is, is really increasing. So I'm not sure that there's um, a, so, a solution to that problem that's technological. Uh, but I think the kind of cooperation at the UN or bilaterally, um, part, you know, partners could give can help uh, very much with making progress under very difficult circumstances. Yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. I think one of the, one of the benefits or uh, non-scientific benefits of the technical development that we do, particularly with the regional projects and these new um, type of projects where we invest um, in MEMIC and PhD students, is building that sense of community amongst the people very early on, um, early on as students, getting them in contact with researchers, um, students doing similar things in other countries, and building a sense of community, working towards common goals. Um, and hopefully the, the expectation is that those people would flow through down into government and, and move up through government and maintain those links and that sense of community that's not just a local community but a regional community, which I do think you get within the Sahil. They have this sense of community within the Sahil, which I think is a very um, powerful, a very strong um, um, component of their identity. And, and that's something that we can leverage to help build capacity there. And one of the things I think we at the agency can do is in the context of a regional project, we can look at investing in capacity in regional centres, regional areas, rather than in, in each country. And in areas like the Sahel, which, as you were saying, are, are very low development index, we don't necessarily want to be working towards investment in every country. We, we need to be able to spread that capacity. And I think that these types of projects that we, we are currently working on, where we bring these people together in a regional context, we are running regional training courses, are really good at doing that. Stefan, if I come back to you, adaptation strategies. Adaptation in the Sahil, the Horn of Africa, these are important, um, these are important developments that we need to do to need to bring to those areas. In terms of a, a meteorological perspective, or the, from the WMO's perspective, do you have any insights into what are the core adaptation strategies that might be relevant for the Sahil? That something that we could look at from the IAEA's perspective about incorporating into the, 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 the work that we do? Mm. Thank you. Am I allowed one more word on the, the regional uh, capacity building? And I'm, I'm, I'm not forgetting sure. the capacity, uh, excuse me, the. Uh, climate change adaptation um, question. You know, um, in, in one of my previous jobs, we, we also did um, regional uh, training and bringing people together from, from transboundary river basins. And yes, you, you discuss uh, hydrological modeling, isotope techniques, or, or whatever. It, sometimes it doesn't matter. It, it matters in terms of what you want to achieve. But, but one thing which we shouldn't underestimate in these regional approaches, and I fully subscribe to what you said, is you, you bring people together and it's not efficient to, to have a little lab somewhere and then people go away, they get promoted and then instruments are not maintained and, and all these issues. So to, to concentrate this in regional hubs, bring the people there together because they also build up these social bonds. You know, We, we did this in the Mekong, for, for instance, with all the lower Mekong countries as well as China and then after two years of a postdoctoral training on climate change adaptation, it was so normal for them to, from the Chinese to write emails to the to lower Mekong countries because they, they collaborated with them, they co-published papers with them. And you know, they really, it's kind of these drinking beer at conferences and all that which, which really forms a bond and then makes it so much easier to, to ex 
you know, to do your best to exchange. Of course, we have to perform in our in our policy settings, but but still, you, you break the ice, and, and therefore these regional approaches are are very useful in, in many environmental sciences. On your climate change adaptation question, uh, when you think about water, we we are most of us like here as water experts today, and um, if you look at climate change, often there's there's a kind of a uh, a bit of a bad story about water. Water floods and droughts, they become more frequent and more severe and people drown and uh, infrastructure is washed away and it's all kind of bad and it gets worse through climate change. That is true, but we have been saying that for how many years now? And, and have, were we able to really change the dialogue on that? Not, not really, huh? So I wonder if, if we kind of enter into that with a bit more positive spin. From water is a problem of climate change and water is part of the solution to climate change. And uh, earlier this week, the uh, water and climate leaders, uh, which we, a group that we facilitated at WMO in my, in my group, they, they published a statement for the COP and it's kind of really, it's an, an, they call that a change of the narrative on water and climate change or an imperative on that. And, and it's really a much more positive side. So if you invest in water, it really can make a, a, a great, uh, great impact on climate change adaptation. You can avoid tremendous costs. I spoke about earlier warning earlier today, uh, and the global, what is it called, the Commission on, on Global Adaptation or what? I uh, forgot the exact name, the, the, the guys in, in, in Rotterdam. They, they made a ranking and, and, and kind of one of the best adaptation investments you can do is early warning systems, they said. So they, they have these multipliers, every dollar you put in pays back with the uh, power to, uh, with 10 times, so I'm not so sure about these multipliers of how true they are or sound, but it definitely shows that investments in early warning can really pay back to society big scale. Or uh, investments in water management to make society more resilient. You know, you create jobs through nature-based solutions, you can help capturing carbon in the soil through, through certain water management with combined irrigation, rainwater harvesting and whatever. So there's a, a number of techniques which, which are part of the solution, so it's not only this um, this picture, climate change and water is, a problem, is the big problem. It's, it's kind of what are the water management techniques that we have available to be part of the solution. And then in climate change adaptation, it's basically water management. It's to a large extent water management. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of people who say that the climate crisis is really a water crisis. It's having enough water of the right quality in the right area in order to do the things that we need to do, to grow the crops that we need to grow, to have water to drink. So, so understanding how that system is changing, and maybe as you say, maybe we need to think about that in a more, in a more positive sense rather than a negative sense. Um, in the Sahil, I know the, the conversation usually is around having too little water all the time. Um, and um, maybe I can bring up groundwater specifically because groundwater is in the Sahil is something that we've been working a lot with. Um, looking specifically at where the groundwater is and what its age is um, to evaluate how sustainable the groundwater supplies are. Um, and we, um, we, a lot of the data that we generate there is very useful um, to help people understand, or different UN agencies understand, where, um, where water is likely to be sustainable and can support development. But also um, in the Sahil, where we have moving, people moving from one area to the other, where we have unstable human settlements, um, what the impact on the groundwater supplies is going to be. Stefan, if I, I just want to come back to you straight away. Because one of the adaptation strategies for climate is groundwater. Right? People become more dependent on groundwater. Um, and we use that to support diminishing surface water reserves. Do you think, I know this isn't really a capacity development issue, but it's, a, it's an issue that affects future, um, pop, or future um, generations, shall we say. Because do you think that groundwater is a sustainable adaptation strategy? Uh, one of the things that we work with with isotope hydrology, looking at groundwater, is how long it's been there. And a lot of groundwater systems that are being abstracted now 
are fossil groundwater systems. And a lot of people are concerned about whether we, if we are removing all of that groundwater and it doesn't get replaced, how does that affect future generations? And those future generations may be impacted in ways that are not anticipated right at the moment and that will affect capacity development in future generations. Do you have a perspective on the, the push to use groundwater? Yeah. No, no, thank you. And groundwater, well, it's the year of groundwater, 2022, huh? It and by is. the way, there is a UN water groundwater summit in uh, early December. Exactly. Where Jody and I, I think, we're in the same session. Yes. <laughs> but uh, let's, uh, that, that was my PR moment. Uh, um, it's certainly part of the solution and, and understanding the groundwater, what type of groundwater is it, how is it recharged, how is sustain, what is the sustainable, sustainable abstraction rate that we can do in a sustainable way. Um, that, is, that is absolutely critical to understand. So therefore, in many regions, groundwater can be part of the solution. If you look at, um, previously I worked for a couple of years for IMI, International Water Management Institute, as director of water food and ecosystems. And uh, there we, we did some of these global analysis. And uh, for Africa, um, it's around 5%, that it varies regionally a bit, uh, what the irrigation source is groundwater. It, 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 there might be some regions where it's more, but overall, average on Africa, it's largely surface water. And in many parts of Africa, you do have groundwater resources that can be utilized. The people know where it is. Um, it, it could be uh, just alluvial filling in, in, in riparian rivers. It, it could also be deeper groundwater. And, and it, it, but really understanding the resource, its characteristics, its what is the sustainable abstraction rate, could really help us and, and really ensure um, more food security in Africa. Because I also, as you said, groundwater, what do you do with it? And, and, for, and from a food security point of view, it is irrigation is, is a key thing that needs to be further developed as, as a water, as a climate adaptation technique. So therefore, groundwater has a, a, a huge role to play. It's often underestimated. Yes, often the groundwater is not exactly there where we need it, and, and um, there, there, there's, there's challenges, but, but it's not that use of surface water without challenges. So, so it's kind of a better understanding that these interactions between surface water and groundwater, better understanding of the, the resources and its characteristics in space and time help us to, to more sustainable um, use them. But also groundwater is not the silver bullet as, as you already implied in your question. It, it, it depends very much on local circumstances. All right, thank you for that, Stefan. I, I think I'm going to start to wrap it up now. Um, if, I, if I take one thing away, though, and I think that made an impression on me, is, is the idea of the sense of community. Um, capacity development is about building skills. And we don't want those skills to be just in the moment skills. We want those skills to last and bring about meaningful change. And I think building those relationships and those connections that last a lifetime is a really important way of doing that. And I think that science, from my perspective, and I fully acknowledge that I'm completely biased, but I think science is a good way of doing that, bringing that community, sense of community together. Um, I think that many of the issues that we've talked about now are not necessarily unique to the Sahil. Um, some of them are, but some of them are general um, the issues to do with capacity development that we could focus on. Um, and I think if we talk about sense of community, um, also the greater working together and cooperation between our development agencies as well. So if I might say, Stefan, the, the work that you're doing, we do definitely want to bring more isotope hydrology into it and work with you better on it. Elizabeth, would love to discuss more the, the complexities to do with peace and security and the role that water plays on that. And I know that Christoph and I will have many discussions going into the future about how we can continue to build capacity development within the programs at the International Atomic Energy Agency. So I'd like to say thank you for the three of you for joining me and having this conversation, which covered many um, different components of capacity development, both here and now, as well at the end there, looking towards the future. Um, and I look forward to working with you uh, in the future on water projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.